Lord, we need to learn to hear your voice. We need, especially in this day, with so much going on, we need to hear clearly. We need to be able to discern your voice. And so we ask that your anointing would come not just upon the teaching, but upon our ears to hear what the Spirit says. And Father, because you speak uniquely, with a unique combination of the ways you speak to each individual, help us to recognize that which is ours, that which is your language to us as we go through this series. Father, only you, only you can hone our discernment. We choose to let the Holy Spirit guide us. Father, in your precious name I pray, amen. Now this is the voice of God, lesson one. Let me tell you how I came to this series. I was teaching in the college in Toronto, and most of my class uh, members were pastors of 15 to 30 years. And one of those came up to me and said, Dr. Bill, how can we know we've heard the voice of God? And of course, externally, I was nice and calm, cool, collected inside and said, oh my, if he doesn't know how to hear God's voice, what shape are his people in? And so I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, what do I do about this? And he said, you teach a class on the voice of God. I said, then what's the key to this? I mean, how, how do I even approach it? He said, you find every way I spoke in the Word. And you study that and teach how I communicated with men from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And that was a huge study. But we developed the course and we're teaching from the notes on that uh, for this season. So we're going to look at, we're going to discuss the ways God speaks. And there are many more than I thought when I started the course, when I started to to investigate and research. We're going to look at how do I recognize those voices? Or how do I recognize those ways God is speaking? And this is, number three, is very, very vital, I think, especially in this day. How do I judge the word I think I'm hearing? And then we're going to talk about types and shadows in the word. And all of these things are very important because you see, I really believe God is, we're living in the day of His voice. There's a, I think it's uh, in Isaiah, it talks about the day of the voice of the Lord. And <clears throat> we'll probably come across that scripture in our journey, but the end time, the last day, is the day of the voice of God. So we're going to take a progressive foundation journey. In Genesis 3 and 8, the first speaking of God to man. And they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now I could not resist this illustration I have up here. Because the voice of God came walking. So I put a pair of lips over combat boots. <laughs> Very good. Okay? And and the thing is, the voice came walking. It didn't say a body, but the voice came walking. There was an expression of a progressiveness in the voice of God. He said in Psalm 32 and 8, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. There's a path God wants me on. And that path, in some senses, although the there are absolutes and there are foundation things in God relating to me. That path is different for me than it would be for someone else because God is preparing me for a place in His body. And that is a unique place. Then He goes on to say, I will guide thee with mine eye. Hmm. My grandmother... All she had to do was look at me. If I was doing wrong, 
One look, and she guided me with her eye. <laughs> and God says, by the way, I don't think it's an angry eye that God guides us with, but it's a so knowing. I remember my first church was an independent church, and like I think I said Thursday night, an independent church is independent of one another, independent of the pastor, and independent of God. Uh, and, but in my first church, we had some very interesting things. One of the things that happened, we had a fellow come to speak, and he got off. And I looked back at my wife, she was holding a baby, I was holding a baby. I looked back at her, and she knew what I was saying. And she began to pray immediately, and the guy couldn't reach him. Five minutes and he was done. God shut him down because we had communication and two agreed as touching any one thing. So there is a there is a communication with the eye that is deeper and farther and more mature than communication with the voice. Does not the conviction of having known that when you eyeball with the upper echelon, so to speak? May bring that thoughts to you. Yeah. You, your, your personal confession. Right. Yeah. Now, the voice is found in the beginning of the, in the middle and at the end of the scriptures. In Genesis 3 and 8, the voice of God came walking. And the, the scriptures are a book of the voice. They are a progressive revelation of the voice of God. Job 42 and 5. Job, the book of Job, is God taking a man from hearing God to seeing God. At the end of the book, number one, Job did nothing wrong. Any teaching that says he did contradicts what God said. And I prefer to believe God. Okay? God said to the, the um, three friends, <laughs> yeah. he, he said, You have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job has. But God had to strip Job of his ability to hear so he could take him into another dimension or Job would have interpreted what God was doing in the old. And so it's important to realize, again, this is speaking of the progressive working of God to bring us to being guided with what? His eye, Psalm 32 and 8. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 8, the voice of my beloved, lo, he comes. Song of Solomon, chapter 5 and verse 2, it is the voice that knocks. And Revelation 3 and 20 picks that up and said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. voice. A relationship with the voice of God is what God is inviting us into. Now, the first principles of the speaking of God. This is probably one of the most important scriptures in understanding uh, the voice of God. Hebrews 5 and 12. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. Now, first of all, the principles of God relating to us. You know, when, when a baby is born, and everything is copacetic. Usually the mother breastfeeds the baby, the milk, right? What does that do? Bond. It bonds the baby to the mother. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the milk of God, or the milk of the Word, is the bonding with God through learning to recognize His voice, not through doctrine. Mm -hmm. Now, I was brought up on doctrine. 
You know, my doctrine is built on nothing less than Schofield's notes and scripture press. I dare not trust the sweetest check frame, but check it out with Thompson Chain. On dates annotated, now I stand, all other doctrines sinking sand. But we were brought up on doctrine, but we did, like the pastors that came to me, we didn't know the voice of God. Yeah. We knew what Scripture said. We may have memorized it, or we may have been like the Jews and memorized the whole Torah. I was saved under a man who quoted the whole book of 1 Corinthians the night I got saved. That's all he did. He didn't preach. Under the anointing, he quoted 1 Corinthians. But memorization is not knowing God's voice. The knowing of God's voice bonds us to El Shaddai. One of the meanings of El Shaddai is the many-breasted one. God's heart, the milk of the word, are the principles of knowing the voice of God. Now that alone should change our approach. Okay? Job 33, 14 to 29, there, and we'll deal with this uh, later, is the progressive speaking of God. God getting my attention and doing the work in me through His voice. In 1 Kings 19, 9 through 11, there was a new speaking. And I want to look at this because... I believe that we're going to begin to hear God's voice in ways that have not been released before because the need is greater. Mm -hmm. If we're coming into the, the days of the greater, greater works than these shall you do. What we didn't know is greater problems than these shall you have. He didn't say that. And yet if there's a greater need, then there's going to be a greater it's going to come out of a greater difficulty, a greater problem. Yeah. And so we get upset when God speaks something and then things go whopper job. But we need to realize God's bringing us into the greater, a greater revelation of who He is, how He functions, and His relationship with man. Mm -hmm. In Job 33, 14 to 18, Let's just read that, just, just to uh, catch the context of it. Job 33. This is Elihu the prophet, actually, speaking after Job had finished and the three friends had finished. Starting verse 14. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. Under, underline that word in your mind because perception is a function of my spirit not my mind and not my soul in a dream and a vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men and slumberings upon the bed then he openeth the ears of men and sealeth their instructions by that he may withdraw man from his I put it there his own purpose and hide pride from man. He keeps back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. And then it goes on and speaks of other ways that God deals to get the attention. But it's, it's progressive. If I don't hear at the first, God does not stop and say, Oh, you're not listening. Thank God. <laughs> now God speaks once, yet twice, yet man perceives it not. It's not restrictive, but multiple times on one matter. You know, if, if you take an overview of the scriptures, and when I study the scriptures, I use a chronological Bible. Because what it does is it shows me the progressive dealings of God to bring a man or a woman to what he wants, or a nation. And we begin to see how God works with a man and builds in a man. The calling of Abraham in the right order shows you the order that God will deal with us to increase our faith. 
It shows the order of God building a covenant. And often we, these are stories to us and we don't catch the ways of God in them. So in dreams, visions, and what I call sea of doors, look, look there for a moment at uh, verse 16. Now this is, uh, by the way, this is done in the night time. Very, very uh, few times you find a daydream in Scripture. So God speaks more in your night times, in your dark times, than in your day times. Hmm. We'll come to some more of that. I think it's in this lesson. Okay. Sealed orders, it says, he openeth their ears, the ears of men, and seals their instructions. He opens the spiritual ears, put the instruction inside. Do you ever wake up in the morning, have a dream, and think it was significant, but couldn't remember? Mm -hmm. One day I was talking to God about that, and he said, that's when I put sealed orders in you. And if you've been in the military, sealed orders are not open until you're on site. And so often what they would do is they would say, look, when you get to such and such coordinates, open this envelope. Until then, the orders were sealed. I remember being in, uh, asked to go to Little Bear Mountain in Colorado and uh, to check something out. And I got there, and the owner of the uh, beautiful, beautiful place, the owner of the place and I sat up most of the night talking. And about five times throughout the, that night, we would hit on something and something in me would say, you've been there before. You've done this before. And yet I've never been there before and I've never talked about that subject with very many people at all. And I said, in the morning, it was about four o'clock in the morning when I went to bed, I said, Lord, what was that? He said, I was opening sealed orders. And your sense of deja vu was actually the opening of the orders. Letting you know you were in the right place, at the right time, saying the right thing. And I thought, wow. But that's the progression here. Why does God do this? Because he wants to withdraw man from his own purpose. And you know, sometimes we read it, but we don't read it. When God speaks to me, He's dealing with my pride. Hide pride from man. I have watched people who uh, were prophetic. I've watched them become proud because they can hear from God better than others. Listen, the enemy is going to find a way to tempt us to get off track. There are people who, their prophetic accuracy is awesome, but there's an attitude. And so God has to deal with that attitude. And he keeps back my soul from going down to the pit, or from going off track, even though I'm hearing from God. Now we're going to do more on that passage later. Now, I'm hearing God in a new way, and I want, I want to look at this because I believe it's very, very important for the days we're in. This is the, the incident with Elijah, and Elijah had just had the greatest victory uh, of his whole career, prophetic career, and Jezebel said, you're going to be dead tomorrow. Now, here's a principle that I just want to mention and somewhere along the line we may teach more on it, but after our greatest victory is usually our greatest vulnerability. Elijah was vulnerable because God had answered by fire, and in the peak of the moment, the enemy came in with an attack. That will always be the way. The enemy will endeavor to take us out before these were established, in what God wants, okay? And then, of course, Elijah went into deep depression. 
So his, his peak of ministry became his greatest vulnerability. And he came thither under the cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came unto him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And then jump down to verse 11. Because Elijah whined, said, I've been, you know, I, I've really stood up for the Lord of hosts, and, da -da -da -da, and, and I, I'm the only one left. Poor me. And God said to him, Go forth and stand upon the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains, breaking pieces the rock before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. But after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, God calls him to the mouth of the cave. I call that self-pity cave in. We, of course, none of us go there. That's an unknown in most of us, right? <laughs> God caused the wind. Now, this is a principle we must see. God caused the wind, but God was not in it. There are things that God will cause in our life, but He's not in it. God caused the earthquake, but he was not in it. And there are people who get distracted by what God causes and is not in. God caused the fire, but, but he had just come from God answering by and, and God was in, obviously, in that fire. But God caused this fire, but he was not in it. His presence was not there. His voice was not there. Then he heard a still, small voice, a way that Elijah had never heard God before. A brand new way. This is the first time it's ever mentioned in Scripture. And I believe we're coming to days when we are going to need to hear God in ways we never had before. If we are stuck in the old, then we will not hear what God is saying. A delicate whispering voice is what this still small voice means in the original. By the way, when God speaks in a whisper, He's usually telling you a secret. I remember being in a church and they asked me to teach, so I taught the Song of Solomon. And, and this uh, man was getting married for the first time. And, uh, they were both there in the meeting. And I said, you know, you don't yell at your, the one you love across the parking lot. And he said, why not? <laughs> I said, because it's intimate. God was getting intimate with Elijah. Now the work done by his voice, God's, when God speaks, there needs to be a work done in me. That's why he speaks. Remember that in Genesis, there was the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and God said the power of his voice. But we have left that in the general. And it's time we begin to see that God has specific things He wants to do with His voice when He speaks. Hearing God's voice brings immunity to disease. Exodus 15, 26. Isn't it interesting that it is not healing? God doesn't want just healing. If we will hear His voice and obey His voice, it brings immunity. Hmm. Second of all, dimensions were brought into it. These are not just theological positions, but experiential places that God will bring us into by a sensing and knowing. He wants to bring us into a peculiar people. And that <clears throat> is not funny or strange, okay? A nation of priests 
Now we see it there in Exodus 19 and 6, but it's also in Revelation 5 and 10. God's purpose is not changed from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. A holy nation. That also is found in Peter. But a royal people in 1 Peter 2 and 9 and Revelation 5 and 10. Again, the old, he told them that he wanted them to be a royal people, but the, again, the purpose of God has not changed. And we're brought into that by his voice and speaking. How important is it that we learn the voice of God to us. These things that God wants to bring us into are not brought into by doing works, although we may do works as a result of what He says. But we are brought into being the chosen generation by His voice. In Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. His voice gives vision. Now, <clears throat> because of the importance of this passage, we're going to look at it in a number of translations. And in each translation that we use, another aspect of what God calls vision and its ability is seen. Whether the God Speak translation says, where there is no vision, the people break loose. In other words, there's nothing to restrain them. Your vision restrains you. Your vision guides you, in Moffat's translation. People break loose without a guiding hand. The ESV, where there is, and catch this, where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. How important is the prophetic? <clears throat> the Amplified Version says, Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelations of God, the people perish. God wants to give us ongoing redemptive revelations of God. That means relationship. Revelation comes through relationship with the revelator. In Hosea 4 and 6, it says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Therefore, the people that doth not understand shall fall. God wants us, wants to reveal to us a knowledge that will change our perspective, change our thought life, transformed by the renewing of our mind. How does that come? By hearing His voice and responding. Now, the principles of the voice. God walks in the cool of the day. Some of us are morning people. Good morning, Jesus, where are we going today? And others get up in the morning, oh Lord, it's morning. If that's your attitude, morning is not your cool of the day. <laughs> the morning, God wants you when you're most alert. Okay? And that could be the middle of the day, that could be the evening. There are some people who are night owls. They're most alive at nighttime. They're most alert at nighttime. That's their cool of the day. Now, Israel never heard God's voice until Sinai. Only the leader did, leaders did, Moses and Aaron. The cloud led them to the place of hearing. The presence of God, represented by the cloud, wants to lead you to the place of hearing God. Oh, I wish we could hear that. We get so excited by the presence, but do we listen to the voice for which the presence, the reason the presence came? They were saved in Egypt. The blood was applied in Egypt, but they personally only heard God at Sinai. By the way, at, at Sinai, every Israelite heard God. What does that tell us? It's God's heart to speak to every individual. That everyone be able to hear God's voice and respond. I love this one. I love this one. In number 7 and 89, he spoke from off the mercy seat. 
When Moses was gone into the tabernacle of the congregation to speak with God, then he heard the voice of one speaking to him from off the mercy seat that was upon the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubims, he spake unto him. And this is the principle that God gave me. God's voice is pregnant with his mercy. Now, I don't know about you guys online or here, but I was brought up in a, under a teaching of a God of judgment. If you don't do it just so, you're going to get whacked. And so there was an ungodly fear that was put in me. And when God spoke this to me, it reverberated in my being. The voice of God is pregnant with mercy. This usually expressed when we examine the conditions of the if, where God always gives us a choice. If you will, I will. A dictator gives you no choice. God is not a dictator. God gives choice. And with his choice, if you follow scripture all the way through, you'll find that God's mercy. I, I remember being at the class one day and I writing on the whiteboard and we're, I can't remember what we were doing and God spoke to me. He said, I want you to, to go through the scriptures and talk about the mercy years. I said, what? The most prominent illustration is Noah. Noah heard at the beginning of the 120 years there's going to come a flood. I'm going to wipe out everybody but you and your family. Noah preached on that mercy for 120 years. God gave, he spoke the judgment, and he gave the people 120 years to repent. Those are mercy years. He could have said enough and wiped them off and sent the flood. No, the mercy of So I went through and I realized that God spoke to Israel. And he said, if you don't do this, if you don't do this, then I'm going to wipe you out. And then there were 400, well, when he first spoke it, to the time of the captivity in Babylon, it was 700 and some years of mercy. Why are we not taught the mercy here? How many know I had to change my thinking? I had to change my perspective? And I am not sure that we yet have a revelation of the mercy of God. Mm -hmm. Now God speaks of in the fire, Deuteronomy 4.33. Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire in your life? I mean, the fire, as thou hast heard and lived. God speaks out of midst of fire. And I want, I want to take some time on this next point because I believe it's vital to understand. In Deuteronomy 5.22, these are the words the Lord spake in all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness with a great voice. And he added them all. And he wrote them on two tables of stone and delivered them unto me. When the spiritual reality is considered, this point is extremely important. And we're going to, I'm just going to read through a number of these scriptures, but I want you to, to grasp the, the, the principle of darkness. And then we're going to, to talk about when we go through darkness. Because see, the Old Testament lays out the principles of God. We have, when we do away, there are churches that basically say the Old Testament's no, no, not valid anymore. But the Old Testament illustrates the principles of God if I will look and see. In Exodus 20, 21, and the people stood afar off and Moses drew near unto the thick darkness where God was. Deuteronomy 5, 22 to 24, these words the Lord spake unto all your assembly in the mount out of the midst of the fire, of the cloud, and of the thick darkness with a great voice. 
And he added no more. Verse 24. And he said, Behold, the Lord our God has showed us his glory and his greatness. We have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. We have seen this day that God doth talk with man and man lives. What does that tell you? They thought when God spoke, that was it. They were done with it. First or Second Chronicles 6 and 1. Then said Solomon, the Lord has said, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. Now that's an interesting one, isn't it? Psalm 18, verses 9 through 11, and he bowed the heavens also, came down in darkness with under his feet, and he rode upon a cherub and did fly, yet he did fly upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his secret place. His pavilion round about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. Now we're going to pull all this together in a moment. Psalm 97 verse 2. Clouds and darkness are round about him. Righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne. Psalm 139 verse 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Now, multiple scriptures have been used to help us realize that God himself has said he would dwell in darkness. God, who is light, dwells in darkness. And here's the big one. How? <clears throat> Now, consider this. There are four coverings on the tabernacle. Remember that the tabernacle of Moses is God's outline of the heavenlies. According to what Hebrews tells us. <clears throat> and according to what God himself said when he talked to Moses. See that you build it according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. The tabernacle of Moses is the perfect pattern of God. And so if we can find it in the tabernacle, in type and shadow, there's a reality there that God wants to communicate with us. Now, there are four coverings on the tabernacle. The linen, which is the closest to the ark, the closest to all the furniture. It comes down over the sides of the golden buildings. Okay? Then there's the goat's hair of the darkness. When I asked God about this, I said, Lord, what in the world are you saying? He said, to get to my presence, you go through darkness. Remember that God's day does not start in the morning. In Genesis it says, and the evening and morning were the first day. Isn't that interesting? We have made the morning the beginning of the day. But there's a principle in God. When, whenever God lays out something, there's a principle there we need to say, Lord, why did you do it this way? Not in a, why did you do it this way? But in, Lord, I need to know. I want to understand your ways. I want to understand why. And so, in coming to that presence of God, there is a going through darkness to get to he who is light. There is a night time that it's called, in one place it would be called the trial of your faith. We've noticed that God speaks in dreams and visions. 90% of the time those are in night and the night is the time of darkness. And so, when we are going through a dark, dark time, are we listening for the voice of God, or are we railing against the darkness? When I lived in Christian community, we had this chorus that someone can, uh, I, I think they, they got it themselves, the night. <clears throat> the sun is always shining, it shines above on a stormy day, even in the dark, it's night time. It's just the world that's turned away. 
If you keep your praises climbing, you'll find light above the storm. Don't curse the night. It's in God's timing. Trust endure until the morn. And so the goat's hair is right next to the presence of God. When Moses went up to the mountain to meet with God, he had to go through the thick darkness to get to the throne of God. When, when the children or when the elders of Israel went up the mountain, they had to go through the darkness to get to them. I call it lunch with God. And it wasn't kosher. It, it was kosher. There was no pork there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Then the ram skin, the covering of, that represents the covering of the blood. The badger skin is the walk of faith. By the way, when you looked at the tabernacle in type and shadow, and it was all set up, all you saw was the badger skin. You didn't see the work that went on inside. Oh, are you hearing me? People see your walk of faith and they think you're doing great. They don't know what's going on inside you. But in that darkness, God's communicating. The goat's hair is the last covering before the linen one representing before coming into the light. Darkness must be traversed. Now, one last thought. Genesis 1.5 And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and the evening and the morning were the first day. The order of God is evening and morning. Evening is a time of transitioning into darkness. But the biblical evening is the time when the day starts. God's day starts in the evening. And so in, as God is bringing you and you're coming into what you think it's darkness. Recognize that in God, you're coming into a new day. Now, often it's not appreciated because we don't understand the principle. Okay? In the spiritual dealings of God as we grow, a new day of the dealings always starts with a revelation from God. Then a trial of your faith nighttime. Then the dawning of walking out the revelation received and try, which we call day. In Zechariah 14, 7, it says, at evening time there shall be light. We can translate that, at evening time there shall be a revelation or a word from God, and faith comes by hearing. So when God speaks something fresh to me, I should expect what? A night time. A trial of my faith. And often, because we haven't been taught this, we are surprised by it and think we've done something wrong. When the reality is, God's bringing us into something new, something fresh. And when the night time of trial is done, we're going to walk out what He has said to us what the voice has communicated to us. This truth concerning God's relationship with us here in darkness was too important to understanding God ways, God's ways to not expound it and spend time on it. Understanding the ways of God is extremely important. So basically... Faith in the blood of Jesus will take us through the darkness to his presence. Right. Let's say that again. Faith in the faith, faith in the blood of Jesus yes. will take us through the darkness to his presence. Right. That's powerful, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it explains, sometimes I tell people, ask God to take you on a tour of your spiritual history. And show you some of these things that you didn't know then, but you went through them anyway. 
You went through them anyway, and, and you still don't understand why. And, and I don't believe we have to go through it again. I believe if we'll let the Holy Spirit lead us on a tour of our history, we can learn things and have imparted into our spirit the truths that we didn't know then, just through God's journey to our history. What is it we say? People are trying to cancel history. They're trying to rewrite history. And if you don't learn from history, what happens? Repeats. You're bound to repeat, mm -hmm. aren't you? Yep. And are there Christians who keep going the same treadmill, the same treadmill, the same treadmill all the time because they have not learned of Him? Come and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is to present light. Or my burden is to be light. The light of God in me is what God has done in me. Let your light so shine that men may see your God works, uh, good works, the works that God has done in you and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Here's the conclusion. There are times when God speaks in our darkest times and lays out the ground rules for the next season of our life. Deuteronomy 5.23 And it came to pass when you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness for the mountain did burn with fire that you came nearer to me even on the heads of your tribes and your elders. When God speaks out of darkness then what is to be our response? Come near unto God. And we have fought the darkness because we have not known that it is a transition point to the presence of God. It's a transition point to the light of God. It's a transition point from into greater light than we've ever had. Greater presence, greater glory, greater grace, greater faith. Why? Because it's the voice of God that speaks in the darkness that imparts faith into me for the next season. So then we miss the treasures. We miss the treasures. Isaiah says, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places. But because we fight the darkness, we miss the treasure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's through the darkness, not getting stuck in it. Right. The voice of God comes to take us through it. Let me tell you a story just before we pray. Back in 1973, I was living in Peterborough, Ontario. We had started a house group, and we had about 30 in the house group. And <clears throat> we were meeting in a room that we set aside in our house for it, an upstairs room. Um, yeah, about 30 in a, what was it, maybe a 10 by 15 room, maybe 12 by 15 room. That's pretty heavy. That's a full house. That's a full house, yeah. <laughs> And so, um, but one day the Lord began to reveal this truth to me. And so, I began to share it with all the scriptures I've given you today, and the principles I've talked about. And two young men who we had brought into areas of uh, authority with us, able to minister the word, good men, uh, they said, wait a minute, that's not true. God is light. I said, they said, we're done with you. Finished. I said to them, I said, can you show me in scripture where I'm wrong? No, we can't, but you're wrong. And they left and took 25 of the 30 with them. We had 30 in the morning, 
And in the evening meeting we had five, and then five for the rest of our time there. And I really got upset. And I went into deep depression. Because I didn't realize all that God was saying. I didn't realize this was a transition into a new revelation of God, a bigger revelation of God. And so, <clears throat> my wife phoned uh, the only man that we knew might be able to help. I, I said, no, I won't help him. He very wisely said, will he listen to me? <laughs> I said, well, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> And he said, listen, he said, uh, will you come down? And he ran Pinecrest Bible Training Center. He said, will you come down and be at this school for a few days? I said, we can't come down, but our car won't make it. He said, well, what if, what if, you, if God supplies a car? I said, well, I guess I'll have to come then, because I'll know it's God. <laughs> well, within two hours, we had a vehicle. <laughs> And I was caught by my own mouth. Wisely, we got there, he gave us a room, and he didn't come near me for three days. He let me marinate in the presence of God in the school, in the chapel services and, you know, in the classes that we attended. And then he came up on the third day and said, are you ready to talk now? I said, yeah. To see the presence of God had softened me up. We had a, a, that was the beginning of an extended relationship and another dimension with that brother. But God was speaking in that darkness, in that dark time, and actually cementing that truth in me, even though I didn't understand. I understood academically what it said in Scripture. But in order to have authority and substance, you've got to go through something. And I believe it was important, although it wasn't pleasant, that I go through it. Because God was expanding my mind and my thinking. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we embark on this journey through the Word concerning your voice, would you attune our spiritual ears to hear and our spiritual eyes to see and our spiritual senses to recognize when you speak we pray in jesus name amen now we are going to be uh, teaching our way through this uh, and I, i'm trying to get it within the 13 weeks but i also want to say that if you have questions don't be